This is the Main Attraction Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Justin Strawn and Ryan Nelson. Welcome to the Main Attraction Podcast, where we discuss the biggest television shows and movies in the entertainment industry. I am your host, Justin Strawn. Joining me each week is the other host of the show, and hopefully he isn't as affectionate towards his Ottomans as Bill Camp is, (laughs) Ryan Nelson. Justin, why the hell is Jake Gyllenhaal resting his glasses on his stomach? Have you seen anyone else ever do that? Is that a new thing that I, I don't know about? I don't know. I've never seen that before either. I'm like, I could understand like he had a beer belly and just like needs someplace to put him or something like that. Yeah, but he didn't he's, have one of those. he's not like us. He's, <laughs> he's, not, he's not like us at all. So uh, I was just like, what do you do? I've never seen anyone do it. Like you said, I yeah. That's what the beer belly. That makes sense. Might yeah. be more comfortable. Maybe I should give it a try. Maybe. So, maybe maybe he's trying to start a new trend here. Well, who knows? We'll see. So, yeah. uh, if you've been listening to the podcast and started a couple of years ago, thank you for continuing to listen and making us a part of your day. If you are new to the show, we hope you enjoy it as we talk about the first three episodes of Presumed Innocent on Apple TV+. Plus. Whether or not you are new or irregular and would like more access to the show, you can visit our Patreon page and become a patron of the Main Attraction Podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash the Main Attraction Podcast. You can get Patreon-only content. You can support us at a three, five, ten, or twenty dollar level, and when you join up, we'll shout you out here on the show. If you want ad free access to the podcast, any level of being a Patreon supporter will get you the show ad free. Doesn't matter which level you're signing up for, all four levels get you the show without commercials. Now, if you want additional bonus content, for example, we just recorded a top 10 list of our favorite Hugh Jackman films. Uh, that's an early access. You'll, the, the regular people that y'all, all of y'all will be getting it on. Uh, sometime in middle of July, but our patrons, they're getting it a, a little bit early. So, like I said, it's things like that, uh, you can only get that through the 5 the 10 or the $20 level. So, if you're ever interested in doing that, we'd love to have you as a supporter. You can go to our website and check out the levels and see what uh, best fits you. If you can't be a patron, though, you can help the show out by rating us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We would love it if you left us a 5-star rating. And if you have time, we would also love it if you were to say review while you're on Apple Podcasts. If you want to interact with the show, you can do so. Uh, you can send us an email to mainattractionpod at gmail.com. We would love to hear any thoughts, questions you might have, any uh, suggestions you have. We would love to hear all those things. So go to your email and send us an email to mainattractionpod at gmail.com. Things change, but Deer Park Natural Spring Water is a constant you can count on, bringing you the essence of home for 150 years and counting. Sourced from carefully selected springs, Deer Park Natural Spring Water has naturally occurring electrolytes for a crisp, refreshing taste. Find Deer Park Natural Spring Water at your favorite local retailer today. After 150 years, there's only one thing left to say. Deer Park, that's still good water. All right, we are discussing the first three episodes of Presumed Innocent. It is based on a book that was later turned into a movie in the late 80s or 90s, early 90s. I can't remember exactly when Presumed Innocent came out. I think it was like 89. Yeah, it was somewhere around there. So uh, that movie started Harrison Ford. We are now revisiting that here in 2024, uh, so about 30 years after the book was written. I think the book was written in 86, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, before we do that, let's talk to Jake Jordan. Like 40. Oh, yeah. What did I say? I said 30. Yeah, we're talking about nearly 40 yeah. years ago. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, uh, we haven't really done any discussions on Jake Gyllenhaal as far as yeah. I can rem- remember. So uh, what's your experience with Jake Gyllenhaal been? Man, he, he's an interesting cat because I, I text you about him. There are times where, like, uh, he's a, he was a kid actor, but he was also early on was thrown in the situation. Like, people knew he was going to be famous. He has the look. Right. He was almost Spider-Man. But, like, there are times when he is totally miscast. I think Zodiac, I don't think he was right for Prisoners. There's also times where, like, he is perfect. This is yeah. one of them. Uh, Spider-Man, no, uh, Far From Home, I thought he was perfect in that. And then there are times where he just, like, you're like, what is this guy doing? And then he ends up doing something like Ambulance and Roadhouse that he's perfect for, that you're a complete surprise. So, like, he's had a very interesting career, but it is, it is like, hit and miss. But I think this is something that is going to be huge for him, and I think TV might be a good good place for him to come to. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I mean, look, TV is so, so different than it used to be uh, yeah. 15, 20 years ago, so... And Apple is doing this thing where, you know, one of the one of the one of the draws for a lot of these Apple TV shows is the fact that they are they get 
these big, huge movie stars to come down and do their television shows. And that's one of the big appeals of everything that they do on on their streaming right. service. Uh, so, like I said, anytime they do a show, there's going to be somebody really, really well-known that's going to be a part of it. And that's, that's one of the big draws. Now, the big draw for this is getting Jake Gyllenhaal, who hasn't really done a whole lot of TV in the, at least not a long, long time that I can think of. Yeah. Um, getting him to come down and do television and to bring a completely different take to this role than what Harrison Ford yeah. brought to it. Now, look, I've not read the book. I've not. Did you see the original Harrison Ford film? I did, but I don't. I have no memory of it, and I don't know what the twist is. I know there's a twist. Yeah, I don't know it. I don't know it either. And like I said, I haven't seen it. Uh, I thought about watching it before I watched this, but I was like, you know what? I'll just I'll just hold off and I'll just. Yeah, I, I, same thing. So I'm just going to watch this, and then we'll see whatever ends up happening in with this show. Uh, one of the things that I know that he does do differently, Harrison Ford had like a calmness to the role, like he was like resolute in his belief that he was innocent, and like nothing was going to change that, and he was always he operated like in this steadfast desire just to like I am innocent, I will prove it, it will be proven, there is no doubt about this. There is a franticness to the way that Gyllenhaal oh, yeah. is portraying this. And look, like I said, I haven't seen the original film with Harrison he Ford. He seems guilty AF. Well, that's the, that's one of the things that's really interesting about this is, yeah. you know, we don't know who did this. I mean, they haven't, yeah. the show doesn't like go out of their way to tell us it didn't, right. he's not the one who did it. It's not, go, so there's, they're leaving that possibility out there that he right. could be the person who, who, who committed this crime. Yeah. But, it's the way that he is just kind of like just so frantically like you know everything is working against me i you know i'm kind of freaking out i've got to get ahead of this thing and i've got to constantly be on top of be two steps ahead of everybody because if i'm not then yeah. it's going to make me look worse and worse because every single episode in this thing he looks worse and worse every time well, we see him he has been lying yeah over and over again and even when he starts to tell the truth, he leaves stuff brought out. Up the, he leaves stuff out. Yes, he leaves stuff out to his attorneys, which I've got to think if you're up for murder, not the best plan. No, it's not. It's not the best plan. You need to be a little bit more and, forthcoming. And then also, Ruth Nega as his wife, Barbara, God bless the sweetest wife, the greatest wife I've ever seen on camera. <laughs> you know, he cannot tell the truth to her because, like you said, every episode, he's been hiding something from He's her. been hiding something. Yeah, there's always something that he has left out of the story for what he has previously given. Yeah. So it's, you know, I have to think about it. Like, for a lead character, the stuff we've covered, he might be the biggest POS we've yeah. covered. He's up there. That's that's definitely certain. I have to go back and think about. It. So, I mean, look, we covered House of yeah. the Dragon too. So, I mean, uh, oh, that's true. Good so. point. He's all there. He's he's a, he's they, okay. He's second to the Targaryens right now. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't think anybody can beat up the Targaryens for that. So, uh, but one of the things about this show that is just so incredibly good is the people that they have for these roles are just yeah. insanely yes. good. I mean, Jake Gyllenhaal obviously is Rusty Savage. Is just really good. Ruth Nega, who is like an Oscar nominee, uh, as yeah. as the wife of this thing. Uh, you've got she is unbelievable. You got Peter Sarsgaard as his brother-in-law. Yeah, as uh, oh, what are you talking about? Who, who are you talking about for his brother-in-law? Jake, he's he, Jake, he's Jake Gyllenhaal's brother-in-law. He's married to Maggie. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't realize yeah. that. Okay. So, yeah. So someone who could easily lead his own series. Yeah. It's, you know. You know the third lead. Right. And so, like I said, and what then you have Bill Camp, and what I love is Bill oh, Camp and Bill Camp. Elizabeth Marvel are actually married in real life. Yes. Uh, yes. And so th them as a married couple in this show, they are incredibly they are incredible they together. They are so great. I even wonder if they've brought those fights outside. I, I'd love to hear <laughs> some interviews with them because yeah. those feel like real fights. Oh, it really does. Uh, and look, if you're not sure if, if you've watched any Law & Order SVU, Elizabeth Marvel has played a defense attorney on numerous occasions in Law & Order SVU. She has been in a lot of things. Yeah, she really has. A lot. Uh, so, like I said, the entire cast of this thing is absolutely perfect. Then, I haven't talked about O.T. I cannot pronounce his last name. Fagbinley? Fagbinel? I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. But as Nico De La Guardia, just the ultimate sleazy politician. I mean... He is. And, and I don't know why he's doing that voice, because... Uh, 
His name, he doesn't normally sound like he he's does British. Not. He's British, right. And I, I don't know why. Is that like some kind of Chicago sleazy? But you're right, though. He is sleazy, and sleazy politician. You mentioned the voice. I'm glad you mentioned the voice because I've seen a lot of people who have complained about the voice. I'm like, no, the voice is perfect for this, what he's doing. He's doing some yeah. sleazy politician thing that he just, and every every word out of his mouth just sounds slimy and like, yeah, just like oozing in, in political speak and like, like right. it's perfect the way that he is doing it, and I am just absolutely fan, you know, yeah. just over the top with the, the way that he has done this uh, particular, particular accent. So uh, the show is really really good. I don't know it where really it's good. going. Uh, I don't know how they're playing this entire thing out, but I have really enjoyed these first three episodes. Um, yeah. Well, it's David E. Kelly. Who's, yes, I was going to mention that. Long time TV, and specifically, also- well, David E. Kelly was known for. Doing courtroom stuff. I mean, that was his thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allie McBeal. Right. Uh, I think he was originally on LA started Law. Out at, yeah, he started out on LA Law. Allie McBeal. Uh, uh, Boston Legal. Boston Legal was what another was, one. What, what was the one before that? That uh, what was the Boston Legal like? I'm uh, not God, sure. Dylan was in it. Yeah, I know which one so, you're talking, uh, but I can't remember which one. Like, I know which one you're talking about, but yeah, that's that was another one that he was a, a part of. But like I said, this is kind of what David the he practice. Killed, the practice. You're right. This is what he made. And his- then also, yeah, he's also done the Undoing, the which was one of the last water cooler shows for okay. HBO a few years. Ago. I don't remember that with one. Hugh with uh, Hugh Grant and Nicole Kidman, and it was similar to this. Okay. It was a mystery. Okay, I don't, I don't remember that one. So, uh, but anyway, regardless, like I said, this is what he did. He does he does legal dramas and he does them really really well. He does some with he yeah. can do some with humor. He can do some that are ultra serious. Yeah, he this is the this is his specialty and this is what he does well. And it's been a while since he's kind of done this thing, and he hasn't really lost a step with this thing. This has just been absolutely no. incredible. So, uh, let's go ahead and just get start with episode one. Episode one. It's the introduction to this thing, and what I like about this is they don't just work, come out and tell us that he's been sleeping with uh, Carolyn. What's yeah. her name? Carolyn uh, uh, Polemus. They don't come out and yeah. say it, but obviously, you know, the moment that we learn that he is that she's been murdered. Well, hold on, let me backtrack because the very opening of this thing, I just thought was fascinating. The very opening of this entire series, you've got. Jake Gyllenhaal, who is doing an opening statement in front of a jury saying, you know, talking about, you know, even if you think the guy did it, but you're not sure, you got to, you got to, you got to let him go. Even if you're reasonably certain that he did it, you still got to let him go. You you have to meet the burden of, of, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. If you, there's, if anything that is even a reasonable doubt, you got to let him go. There is no way a defense, a, a prosecuting attorney would ever start with this. Yeah. And the reason I like it, one, is because it just kind of reminds us, like, the whole po- point of this episode, of this show, is you are presumed innocent, reminding you of that. But it's also right. showing this guy is so cocky and so arrogant about yeah. his job that he can do this really stupid opening argument and remind people that, like... Uh, more often than not, you should be letting people go is like basically kind of what he's saying. Right, and the fact right. that we don't. Um, like I said, it just shows who he is as a person and as a lawyer. And it sets the tone for everything that's going to happen afterwards because he is going to be operating from this cocky, arrogant attitude. And he just doesn't understand how his life is falling apart af- af- from this point forward. Yeah. It's just absolutely fantastic. So, uh, But like I was saying... We've learned quickly, you know, the way that he is reacting to Carolyn Polemus' death. You know that obviously something is more, there's more to their relationship than right, just right. co-workers. But nevertheless, they don't come out and just say it. But I thought it was just really good uh, in terms of setting up the characters. Because this is when we meet the primary protagonist and the primary antagonist. So we've got Jake Gyllenhaal and Bill Camp as Raymond Horgan on one side. And you've got O.T. Fagbinley, or how you pronounce his name, and Peter Sarsgaard on the other side of this thing and they hate each other. They despise each other. And it is just great. This opening interaction. what do you think? It is really good. And the fact that, you know, you have two brother-in-laws on opposite ends and they really do not like each other. No, they don't. 
they don't like each other at all. And it's that's yeah. like the, the primary setup of this entire thing is these two are going to be going after each other yeah. the entire time. Yeah. It's so much to the point where OT uh, Nico Della Guardia, who's played by OT uh, Fabigne, he has to remind Tommy multiple times stick to the facts you're not yeah, this is yeah. not this is not you going after after right. rusty as much as you may want to yeah. you have to put that aside and like he has to keep reminding tommy of that and it feels like yeah. this is going to be the ultimate downfall of tommy in this thing is right. he is so like like the fact that the that his his you know uh, uh his nemesis has fallen yeah. into his lap is just going to be so delicious to him that it's going to make right. him do some stupid things. And we kind of already see one of those things in episode three. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. So, uh, but yeah, it's great because like Rusty, who is again, so cocky and so arrogant is like, I'm going to be the PA on this thing. I'm going to be the prosecuting attorney. Right. Rusty De Raymond hasn't even said it at this point. And when Nico and Tommy say, why are you going to be the prosecuting attorney? He's like, because I'm the best, basically, is what he tells him. And because that guy's still yeah. the boss. Like I said, it's great show. It's just how cocky and arrogant uh, Rusty is. But we also know, he knows he's probably the primary suspect in every instance yes. of this thing going into it. What were your thoughts about that? Yeah, it was very interesting because, like like you said, even as, an, uh, as a bystander, you're like, man, you're too close to this oh, to yeah. be running... But then you're like realizing, oh yeah, he's trying to protect his own ass. He is, uh huh. Because he starts going into overdrive on this thing, and like I said, we don't really know. Uh, we don't know. Like you can kind of figure out pretty quickly that he's been in a relationship with this woman. Yeah. That's, you can kind of figure that out pretty quickly. But we still don't know at the beginning of this thing that Ruth Negus' character Barbara is aware of the of the affair of the affair yeah. but she eventually does come out and say why do you have to be the prosecuting attorney can't they get somebody else who hasn't slept with her to be the prosecuting attorney this is like kind of a big bombshell that they throw to us in episode one right. about you know letting us know that yes she does know who she does know about this affair she does know that they were a couple at one time and that they that he was cheating on her so this is kind of a big deal but also one of the things i found interesting about this the entire time he is going through, uh, he's going through therapy. Uh, he's going to this woman named uh, Doctor yeah. Liz Rush, played by Lily Rabe. And uh, therapy is not supposed to be con confrontational. You're not supposed to like tell your patient they're just an absolutely awful person. But his therapist is hard on him. What were your thoughts about that? Yes. Well, I, you know, to cut the therapy, some, the therapist some slack. He is an awful human well, being. Well, he is, and, complete, but <laughs> and he constantly lies yes he does. and i'm sure the therapist is tired of the lying probably yeah I, yeah i'm sure that she is but i just thought it was amazing that therapists are supposed to be a little bit more like yeah yeah, yeah. they're supposed to be a little more not uh i don't know what's the word i'm looking for uh not one-sided but uh like a mediator thank you yeah. yeah. more of a mediator more uh along those lines basically not picking a side in this thing she's just supposed to just kind of like confront the problem not the actual person so i thought it was really interesting yeah. that she was as confrontational with him as she was uh but what's interesting in this first episode carolyn doesn't come across real well in this thing because all during this entire time that he was in this affair with carolyn he doesn't even realize that she has a son until yeah. the funeral. When he gets to the funeral, he finds out All that right. he has a son, and like she, and like he's wondering, like, why would she keep that from me? Uh, and this is obviously going to come back to bite him later on. Uh, what were your thoughts about actually finding out that she had a child? Well, you know, again, you're thinking, well, these are two terrible people. No wonder right. they ended up together. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, that that's kind of one way to look at it, is that they they were actually <laughs> two terrible people, so it doesn't surprise you that they're together. Yeah, it does. One of the surprising things about this is we don't really see a whole lot about Carolyn in this until we see most mm -hmm. of her in flashbacks. And the flashbacks right. are like a really, really rough sex most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Like I said, I was really surprised just how often we went back to these scenes and the amount a of lot. hair pulling and the amount of like just yeah. like really rough sex that they're giving i was like wow like i don't know what this is trying to say like they're pulling it they're putting their aggressions their frustrations into their sex as well i don't know but it feels like well, they're I mean, saying she something died in aggressive yeah. way so that's got to be part of it also i think they're just trying to make him look guiltier because you know like how many times have they said like he even says she was giving him things 
that his wife wasn't, you know, like right. passion or whatever that his wife wasn't doing. Yeah. Which, you know, just makes him look even worse. It like, makes him look and, worse. And, and, yeah, but I think uh, that was part of it. one of the one thing that they do in this, especially in this first episode, is as awful as he has as he has been, as awful as he can be, they do try their best to like show that the guy is actually trying because he is he is an active father. He is actively yeah, yeah. trying to repair his relationship with his wife. He is doing a lot of things mm-hmm. that you know he's not a good guy but you know he's doing a lot of things to try to make up for the fact that he's not done some of the best things in the world right. and so they're trying to give you something to cheer for him and they're trying to build up some credibility but by the time we get to the end of this first episode especially after this meeting when uh yeah. nico de la guardia has been elected and they're basically turning everything over to them as uh rusty and raymond are losing their jobs and it becomes clear that the number one suspect is rusty in this instance all of that yeah. credibility is gone. All of it's washed down the toilet. Right. Uh, and the biggest thing that comes out about this is Carolyn was pregnant at the time. And so at the time, like, would you submit to a paternity test? And this is when it gets really confrontational. Rusty says, get a subpoena. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll give you one. And this is when he has to re- confess to his wife yet again. The affair started back up. And he's the primary suspect at this point. And this is yeah. like... It looks absolutely And she's awful pregnant. Fun. Yeah, and she's pregnant. And she was... And yeah. he's probably the father, which ended up being yeah, the case. I, the courtroom, I mean, the, the boardroom scene was unbelievable because, again, he walks in cocky. Mm-hmm. And come to find out, Tommy and, and uh, what was... What's uh, Del, name? Uh, Nico De La Guardia. Nico. Yeah, Nico and Tommy have a lot more on him than they realize. Right. And he has not, not been... Uh, honest at all to raymond so raymond's finding out they've been having an affair you know and then and then like he's still acting cocky and rude to them and and raymond's like nah dude you need to be honest now yeah. this is this is different now yeah well, you, know, you can't just tell them to f off you've got to answer their questions right and well he, he, he's got to answer their questions but he's also got to start he's got to start being honest with somebody about this thing because right. he hasn't yeah, been honest with yeah. anybody at this point so uh well, he was is, acting like it was just ridiculous that they would even oh, yeah. ask and come to find out yeah. no they have a right to ask well i think i think he knew this going into it i think he knew that oh, eventually yeah. this is one of the reasons why i think he was pushing so hard to get another person person under the microscope so he initially oh, yeah, yeah. he initially wants yeah. to point the 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 microscope of, of suspicion towards this guy that's in prison already for somebody else that they put away the murder looks a lot like the one this bunny davis person that yeah. he killed uh so they're trying to so he wants to put the the microscope on him because it could look like a copycat and basically that you know that guy i don't remember the guy's name but uh liam reynolds thank you Liam, he's basically trying to say Liam got somebody else on on the outside to do this for him to make it look like a copycat, yeah. and that's what he's trying his best to do. And look, that's still on the table. I don't know if that's going to end up being the case, but it's still definitely yeah. on the table. But uh, I'll be interested to see if that's. And I like Liam too. Liam's been around a long time. I can't. I have to go back and look. I thought he was the guy from the from the fugitive, but he looks like the the the, the bad guy from the fugitive. I think he's uh, been in like, Seinfeld. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But like he's just one of those 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 guys yeah. that's in a lot of stuff, and he's perfect for this role. This is why Gyllenhaal has to be so excited about the show because he is filled with incredible character actors yeah. that are just making him look better. Because this is when Gyllenhaal is looking for a role. This is the role. He looks like a cocky attorney. Right. He does not look like a guy who was on the streets detective and prisoners cocky <laughs> attorney yes he looks like that guy yeah he does you're right about that so all right tell you what let's take a real quick break and then we'll get to episode two and three hey it's kaylee cuoco for priceline ready to go to your happy place for a happy price well why didn't you say so just download the priceline app right now and save up to 60 percent on hotels so whether it's cousin kevin's kazoo concert in kansas city go kevin or becky's bachelorette bash in bermuda you never have to miss a trip ever again so download the priceline app today your savings are waiting go to your happy place for a happy price go to your happy price priceline 
Things change, but Deer Park Natural Spring Water is a constant you can count on, bringing you the essence of home for 150 years and counting. Sourced from carefully selected springs, Deer Park Natural Spring Water has naturally occurring electrolytes for a crisp, refreshing taste. Find Deer Park Natural Spring Water at your favorite local retailer today. After 150 years, there's only one thing left to say. Deer Park, that's still good water. All right, episode two is when things start to kind of escalate in terms of who's going to be charged, when he's going to be charged, because basically at one point during this thing, he's meeting with both his wife and his therapist, and this therapist at one point says, you know, if you're charged, and he's like, if, there's no if. He's like, it's it's when, you know. He's like, they're going to go through my text. They're going to see the things that I texted to her. They're going to see the amount of evidence that I left behind. They're going to probably, I'm probably going to be, uh, determined as the father of this child he's like it's there's no if it's just when i get arrested for this thing uh because yeah. everything points towards him being the guy who, who who did this and uh you know and ruth nega's character is having to deal with this all over again so she thought this thing was done about a year ago and he started it back up again uh and she's oh, having I, my guess it never fully ended my yeah, it'd be my guess as well it probably never fully ended it probably they probably had a little bit of a break but it probably was not much of a break yeah. um so she's dealing with that and you know he's going through a lot and she she kind of pulls a mad mom wife routine which is completely understandable because like i I'm with them. Like you definitely want to tell your children in person. You don't want to hear about this on the news. You don't want to hear about it from oh, your yeah. friends. Uh, but to ambush them like that, that's tough at the, at the dinner table when they're, when, when she does this. Yeah. Uh, so like it completely catches him off guard when he, when she basically forces him to come clean with about this thing to his kids. And it completely ostracizes him from the rest of his family. And for basically the rest of this episode, not quite, but pretty darn close. What were your thoughts about that? Yeah, but I mean, he had to come clean. Yeah, he had to. It was all coming out. Yeah, she ambushed him, but uh, you know, with all the stuff she's dealing with, it's hard to. It's it's easy to understand oh, yeah, her reasonings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is too. Like I said, I, I get the reason why she did it, but that's like I said, that's a that's a tough thing to sit there and have to be yeah. like just jumped on. Like you know, you kind of right. prepare for it, and like there's no yeah. to be able to have to tell your kids that are teenagers, I've been cheating on your mom, and I probably have a. You probably would have had another half brother, half sister had this woman right. not gotten murdered if because of this. So, uh, yeah. like I said, it's just really interesting. Oh yeah, and it looks like I murdered this woman. Yeah, it, it does. It it looks very much like that. So, uh, he also in this episode, I'm pretty sure it was this episode where he asked Raymond to be his attorney. Um, yeah. And Raymond doesn't really know what to do with this. He's talking to his wife, uh, like I said, played by Elizabeth Marvel. She ain't happy. No, she's not happy about it. And th it's a tough scene for, for Raymond because when he's sitting there talking to her about it, she's like, you know, you just lost the election. Let's retire. Let's go off to Florida. Let's enjoy our lives. And Bill Camp's character, Raymond, is like, you know, I get that, but you know this would be a nice way. I hate Florida. Well, he hates Florida, and he also he's like, I hate these two guys, these two pricks who are going to be running yeah. this investigation, and it'd be nice to for my legacy to be able to like show them in like their first very big case as the new prosecuting attorney, right. the new district attorney that you know I screwed you guys over, and then he says one moment at the end there he says. Uh, and it would be nice to have for my life to have a little meaning going forward, you know, like. You're yeah. married, dude. Like that's kind of a really bad thing yeah, to say man, to your wife. Was well, it was also interesting, and this is like a lot of people who are workaholics. I realize, like, Rusty is his only friend. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's like, you know, he's probably my best friend. Yeah, because you, you two, only care about work and only have each other. Right. Yeah, that, that's exactly the case, and you know, this is very much the case for a lot of the people in this in this show. Right. So. Uh, but going forward in this thing, throughout the course of episode two, you know, things start to happen that Rusty is uh, just kind of struggling to deal with. One, he gets arrested. This is They finally do arrest him for, for, for the murder. Uh, they also serve him with uh, a search warrant and a, uh, a mandated paternity test, a uh, subpoena for his paternity test at the very break of dawn, which is something that he would often do to the people. Yeah. And, like, he's just... 
like flabbergasted that this is being done to him. So when he goes to Tommy and approaches him about it, uh, Tommy's like, look, dude, you wrote the book on this. This is what you, this is what yeah. you did. And he's just kind of flabbergasted yeah. that everything is being turned against him. All the same things that he used to do to people is now being used against him. He just is struggling to handle it. What are your thoughts about that? Man, that was wild. Cause it's like, you, this is your playbook. We're following it. Yeah. Every bit of it. One of the other interesting things about this, when he's digging into the case for what was the guy's name, the the guy who's in prison that they've already put away. Oh, uh, uh, I thought it's like a was it Luis uh, Liam okay. Liam Reynolds. Yeah, Liam Reynolds. When he's Liam digging Reynolds. into that case to try to put the blame at him, he comes across the fact there was a second sperm sample on Bunny Davis, and Carolyn apparently knew about this. And she never disclosed it. And this is a huge issue because whenever you are a prosecuting attorney, you have to turn over any evidence that you have to yeah. the defense so that they can give a proper defense for their for their client. And this makes it look like there could have been somebody else who did that, uh, right. who committed that crime. And she purposely ends up holding it back from the prosecute from the from the defense and this is a huge problem uh and he's doing his best to try to find it like i said just kind of continue to shine lights on what carolyn was like how she's kind of like in the same vein as rusty i'll do whatever i need to to win even if it is something yeah. illegal or unethical as well so uh i just right, and it gets you like the liam does have some motive and also he may be getting out yeah so like i said that's this is like just all that is a revelation and it's just one of those things that was really really interesting to me i thought that just was kind yeah, of fascinating I so, agree. uh when he's when rusty's eventually arrested uh they he goes to raymond he still has not gotten an answer from raymond about whether or not he's going to be his attorney but when he walks into the courtroom on the very first uh the very first trial or a, i don't know what you call it me hearing whatever you want to call it yeah. When he walks in, there's Raymond with uh, uh, Della Guardia and with Tommy on the other side of the table. So, like I said, they're setting up, you know, how this is going to play out. Yeah. And they immediately start getting into it. Raymond is just putting on a show as a lawyer. Like, as the actual district attorney, he probably hadn't been in the courtroom a whole lot recently. So, right. getting able to do it again, you just kind of see the fire in his eyes as he's mm -hmm. just being able to litigate actually in person. And it's, it's a great scene. And plus, we meet the judge who's going to be over this case, uh, Judge Little. And it's obvious that he, she wants nothing to do with the with the prosecutors on this. I thought it was great. What would you think? Yeah, I thought it was good, too. And I, it kind of showed that she's not going to put up with their crap in the courtroom, which right. I think we're going to get some interesting scenes later on. Yeah, I think we are, too. I think we're going to get some very interesting scenes. Because she says something along the lines of, like, this type of a case could lead towards long speeches or something like that. And let's just make sure that right. we don't have that or something like, along those lines. So, um, yeah. but, but she also said something about uh, it felt like a hemorrhoid the way they were handled. That was already episode three. That case. was that was episode three. Oh. <laughs> he said that. We're gonna talk about that. So, like I said, I'm was, that was just a fascinating line as well. So, uh, but Raymond pushes for a, a, a quick trial. He doesn't want there to be a whole lot of a whole lot of pre-trial hearings and all this type of stuff. He wants it to go to trial as quickly as possible because that is in his best defense at least. Um, but one of the things that the way that this episode ends it ends with rusty getting this cryptic text about i saw you there i i, I don't remember exactly what the words were but i have pictures or something along those lines and we don't know who it's from rusty doesn't know who it's from uh, initially and this is kind of the way the episode ends on this big huge cliffhanger what'd you think about that going into episode three i was like oh man here we go come on and of course <laughs> we had to wait a week to yeah. find out but i uh, this is going to, as we see at the end of episode three, this is going to be an ongoing thing. They're going to be cliffhangers every oh, yeah. week, they are. which I love. Oh, yeah. If you're going to do a weekly series, give me the cliffhanger. Right. And so far, that's been the case for every single episode. So as we transition here into episode three, you know, this is the thing that we're waiting on. We're trying to find out who it was that sent these texts. And uh, it actually opens, if I remember correctly, with Raymond dreaming about uh rusty killing yeah. and that's one of the mm -hmm. interesting that's things right. about there's there's rusty is having dreams or, or like daydreams about actually having killed her rust uh, raymond's having these dreams i don't know what to make of all that yeah uh, any thoughts about that i i think everyone thinks that rusty did it i really do i think every character thinks he did it well <laughs> 
Raymond keeps saying that he doesn't, and I, I, I tend to believe him. Uh, so well, I don't know. So does Barbara. I don't believe them. I don't, I, believe I don't know. I think, that, I think Barbara. I think Barbara truly believes that he did it. I think that's yeah. very much the case. But like I said, I'm not sure about Raymond. So uh, anyway, when we finally find out, he, he goes to meet whoever it was that sent these texts. He goes and meets him in this um, like abandoned factory or whatever it was. I'm not sure what yeah. that place was. But he goes and meets him, and it's it ends up being. Uh, Carolyn's son, the one that we just he just found out about uh, that he's confronting. I don't know how old Michael is. My guess he's probably like 16, 17, somewhere around there. Yeah, that's what it seems like, yeah. And, but of course, Michael doesn't realize he's making himself look guilty. Yeah, that's kind of, and this is one of the things that Rusty's pointing out is like, you haven't thought about this, Michael. You're like, you were also there, and like these pictures <laughs> you were taking, it was very obvious that you were trying to make it sure that you weren't seen, that you would know that we weren't right. there. Like, so this doesn't look and just. And you hate your mother. You have motive. Right. So he doesn't. He hasn't thought all this through. So, Rusty's like, yeah. you either need to give those to the police, or you need to give them to me, and we need to figure out something. And he's already apparently he's already given them to the Come. defenses. Uh, the defense. I'm sorry, the prosecutors. Yeah. So and this kind of leads us into this next meeting with judge little you've got raymond and rusty meeting with the judge along with tommy and uh, nico and when they're there <laughs> these pictures come up and this is when rusty basically accuses him of, like the defense the prosecutors they're withholding evidence because i've just learned about some pictures that were taken and tommy's trying to be very sly like oh we're still processing them and we're still trying to authenticate them and the judge basically says right. this is once you bring up that line about you know this case is like a hemorrhoid and i can enjoy a hemorrhoid which i don't understand <laughs> that at all yes that was quite a lot yes i've had a hemorrhoid I, there's no way i can think of that being yeah. an enjoyable experience but yeah. uh but again this is another thing where you know because we we talk about i talked about this earlier Tommy's desperation to just kind of slam Rusty and to put him away is so tempting and so just delicious to him. This just kind of feels like this is going to be his downfall throughout the course of this of this of this show. I don't know how it's going to end up turning up. That's just kind of what it feels like because uh, he. Well, I mean, see, like using Michael as one, like like you mentioned the 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 photos make michael look as guilty yeah and he hasn't even turned his attention to possibly as michael right. so yeah uh then we get a uh, meeting between uh nico and tommy they're at a bar or a restaurant and they're having a meal together and they're talking about the case and this is when nico is really stressing to him you've got to focus on the facts of this case you can't focus on yeah. rusty because he even says you know what was the line that you told me when i told you you're now going to be the lead prosecuting attorney and he said well the, the girls are really going to like me now and like he's he's looking at yeah. the status of what this brings to him and and what it brings to him as a person and what it brings to, in the notoriety <laughs> he's not thinking about the actual job itself as much as he needs to be uh okay. so like i said this is going to be the thing i think that we come back to a lot with with tommy's character that being played by peter sarsgaard because sarsgaard is doing the, a great job of just being an a-hole really on this thing bad. he's absolutely he awful. Really is. and i love in season in episode three especially where like he's firing himself up yeah you know like he has that one scene where he's preparing and then also the scene where where he's talking to nico and he's like He's like, I've got this. I've got this. You know, like just how even almost how cocky he is right. and like confident. It's like, oh, man, it's just delicious. I can't imagine like I'm sure I'm sure Jake got his brother-in-law. But like I said, Peter Skarsgård is a is a yeah. known name on his own. He could have led this series himself. Yeah. So to get him in like the third lead, man, we are very lucky. Yeah, we really are. He's been, he's really good. He's doing an incredible job, like I said, of just being the absolute, the absolute bad guy attorney in this thing. Uh, right. And that's one thing I do like about this because lots in lots of these shows, there's always, you know, the good guy attorneys and the bad guy attorneys, and they're right. they're kind of muddling up the waters with with these characters yeah. because Rusty's not that great a guy. Like, I don't think he did it. I, I don't. I don't think he did it. Yeah. But I don't think so. Either. But. You know, you could see. I mean, it's very believable that he could have been the one to do it, and he's not that likable to begin with. So, uh, like I said, all that stuff kind of plays really well on this show because, right. like I said, the bad guy attorneys—they're—they're—they're they're, they're awful people, and they're not really easy to. You don't aren't cheering for them, but you can kind of understand why they're going after him so hard, uh, and right. it kind of makes sense. So, uh, again, 
an interesting moment in this. Uh, Ruth Negas gets her character is going through a lot. She basically gets fired from her job. Not really. Uh, so that's that's yeah. that's a problem because the 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 art gallery that she works for doesn't want. The, it's it's bad for business for her to be around. Basically, right. uh, to commiserate, she goes to a bar and ends up flirting with a younger de- a younger bartender who is very much attracted to her and like, very much into yeah. her and and Lorraine Hog- Horgan's advice almost seemed like go sleep with the guy it'll be fun you'll have a good time sure did <laughs> that was that was one of the better scenes of the show it's like this could do you some good like, yeah wow yeah so like I said that was gotcha. just, that was just an interesting well, my, my guess is uh, Elizabeth Marvel's characters never liked Rusty yeah that's my guess now she has a good reason to hate it. Yeah. So, like I said, she's like I said, inter- dishing out some interesting advice to say the least. So, yeah, uh, I agree. The kids have seemed to have kind of come around. They're not as anti dad as they once were. Uh, you do have an interesting scene at the dinner table when Kyle, played by Kingston Rumi Southwick, basically suggests to him like, "Have you thought about a plea deal? Because you know." Nine years is, and for manslaughter is a lot better than life in prison for. Uh, you, we actually could actually see you again. There, you, we could have a life with you without prison. And Rusty is just kind of taken aback by the scene. He's kind of shocked by it. like, there's no way I'm taking a plea deal on this. So he's like, I didn't do it. So why in the world would I would I take a plea deal? And the another reason why that becomes interesting is because of what we find out later on in yes. the episode. So, um, anyway, what were your thoughts about the family kind of opening back up to him? You know, it it, it makes for interesting drama. I thought the kids actually are doing a really good job. They, are, they have a hard part. I, I've actually enjoyed them. And, uh, man, it, it, this is an interesting family dynamic, and I think they're showing how hard this would be. I can't imagine. I'm shocked these kids are still in school. Yeah, I am too. Because so. when they showed him playing baseball, I thought for sure he was going to get harassed by other right. players. But his that, mom kind of is. His mom is, yeah. yeah so, but, I, you know. Just really surprised they're still in school. Yeah, I was a little surprised by it as well. So, uh, the episode ends basically with the pictures have finally come through. They finally had the pictures that Michael took on that night when he was there at, which is another thing he had to confess to his wife and to his attorneys that he was there yeah. on the night that she was killed, which is yet another thing he continues to just kind of hold information back on. Um, but he he gets these pictures back and. He spends about five minutes going through his iPad on these things, and so we see all these pictures. Nothing just looks really incriminating. Uh, everything, you know, they don't look upset. They don't look like they're having an argument. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of videos in there. So, like I said, there's nothing that's just really incriminating, but until we get to the very last picture, and the very last picture that he sees, and the one that we see, is his son was there. And this is a new revelation, yeah. and it's interesting that it hasn't come up because... Again, Tommy hasn't mentioned the fact that his son was right. there. And maybe he doesn't know his son. Maybe he hasn't actually met him. I don't think he knew. He looked like he was shot. So, like, well, like I said, uh, well, no, I know, I know Rusty did not. Like, Tommy hasn't mentioned oh, that, yeah. that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he may not know that that picture is a picture of his son. He may never have met Rusty's yeah. kids. Uh, but this is a problem because what, the thing that Rusty has been looking for, and it's one of the things that that Raymond has tried to tell him he's like don't stop looking for this other for another guy stop looking for another guy we got to just make it look like you didn't do it that's our big thing and Rusty the entire time has said no there's somebody else did this we got to find somebody else to point the finger at and if this is going to be the case the best person to point the finger at might be his own son so like I said Uh this is something he wasn't planning for when he's been trying so he's been so hell-bent on finding another perpetrator you know you don't want to point the finger at your own son that's a that's a problem so I'll be really interested let me warn everyone David E. Kelly is a red herring king oh he is yeah so Mm -hmm. so just be aware there were multiples and the undoing there were multiples. He was highly involved in Big Little Lies season one. Don't just assume <laughs> Michael did it. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't think that's going to be the case at all. I'll be. I, my guess is we're going to have four or five potential suspects because this thing's only eight episodes long. So we're we're close yeah. to halfway through with it. So, uh, all right. Well, I guess kind of anything else you want to say before we wrap up on this first three episodes? All right. Who do you think did it? Let's just go ahead and go there. I think Tommy did it. Oh. 
I think he's I mean, doing this. Up. I think he's doing the thing that. I think he's doing the thing that Rusty was kind of doing. He's trying his best to point the finger at somebody else because, uh, and he is the in the perfect position and to I, do so. As and I can see Carolyn not taking his advances. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I could see. Okay, I was going to say Barbara. No, I could see that too. Yeah, but uh, Tommy, and especially what you're talking about, I'm going. I'm going Barbara one, Tommy two. Yeah, I could see I could see both of them being being the people who actually did it. So it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. So I, I don't know. I mean, it could be somebody yeah. totally that we haven't even seen yet. Who knows? So. Yeah. All right, uh, all right. That wraps us up for this. Let's go ahead and get to our weekly award, shall we? All right, let's do it. All right, here on the Main Attraction Podcast, whenever we're covering a season of a television show, we always like to do three weekly awards. The first award on our list is the Tyrion Lannister, the MVP for the week. Who is your Tyrion Lannister for these first three episodes? I mean, it's got to be Jillian Hall. Yeah, it right? is. It's got to mm-hmm. be Jillian Hall. He got this show made. I will say, if we did this week to week, Ruth Nega, Bill Camp, or Peter Sarsgaard could easily oh, yeah. you know, get the Tyrion Lannister. But the first three, you got to give it to Jakey. Yeah, I agree with that completely. So, uh, the Agatha all along, the best scene of the week. What you got? I think it's at the end of episode one where we have that confrontation in the boardroom where yeah. you know uh, Tommy and uh, Nico are, are are telling uh, Rusty what all they have. Yeah, that's a really good one as well. I, I thought that was a really good one. So, uh, last but not least, the if you come to King, you best not miss your best line of the week. What you got? I think this came in episode two, and it's from uh, Barbara. You need to stop loving her. You need yeah, to stop loving her. Uh, honestly, anything that comes out of Bill Camp's mouth to me I know, I know. is the best so good. line of the He's week. So good. He has so many incredible lines in this it's he just does. incredible like i said he's fantastic in this so uh like i said anything that came out of his mouth i'm all for so all I right uh rating time here on the main attraction podcast uh whenever we cover a season of a television show we like to rate it as we go along at the top of our list is a succession beneath the succession is a lost middle of the road is friends beneath the friends is a full house and bottom of the barrel forest is a baywatch what are you rating the first three episodes of presumed innocent to me, this is succession. This is as good as it gets, man. I'm I'm addicted. The acting is unbelievable. The suspense. I, I can't wait to see what happens. What's going on next? I'm torn because I'm kind of with you. I, I think like everything about this has been a succession, but I could see that, like if they don't pull like, I know. it off, it could I, go downhill really, really badly. So for sure, uh, yeah. I want to give it a loss for that reason. Uh, I, I fully expect if they do what I think they are capable of doing in, in the course of this episode, that this will be easily end up being a succession. I really do. I think this could yeah. be one of the better, sep- one of the better series that we see this year. Uh, but I do need to see the end product of this thing before, before we get to that point. So, all right. Uh, before we sign off, we like to give some things that we have recommended to our audience. What are some recommendations that you're giving? Well, I'm going. I didn't watch a lot this week, except for Hugh Jackman things. So I'm going to mention <laughs> a few of his. Uh, Eddie the Eagle, which I'd never seen before, it's on Max. I would highly recommend it. Taron Egerton plays a uh, ski jumper, which is the most insane Olympic uh, Olympic game ever. Ski jumping, absolutely crazy. Right. But uh, Hugh plays his uh, coach. Really, really great sports movie. It's on Max. I'd never seen it. it. Came out in 2015. But highly recommend it. The other one, I went back and watched The Prestige and Prisoners. I actually purchased them on Amazon because, of course, none of them are streaming anymore. And you can catch them on sale now. Right. So I would highly recommend it. If you've never seen The Prestige, the Christopher Nolan movie with Hugh Jackman and Christian Bell, highly recommend it. And then Prisoners. The Denny Villeneuve movie with Jake Gyllenhaal, who we have here, uh, and Hugh Jackman, Viola Davis. Fantastic movie. I would highly re- recommend all both of those. Prestige, Prisoners, and Eddie the Eagle. All right. Uh, I also have a – look, the reason we're doing a lot of Hugh Jackman stuff uh, – over the next four, in the weeks leading up to uh, Deadpool and Wolverine, we're going to be doing the top ten uh, Hugh Jackman films and the top ten Ryan Reynolds films. So we're watching a lot of those guys right now. Uh, I would add Real Steel to that. It's a re- there are moments of that movie that are really good, like amazingly good. But there are also moments where it's a little bit too sappy. But 
overall i really enjoyed it i would highly recommend it uh also i finished up the third season of sweet tooth on netflix it is the final season wraps up really well uh, the second season was good but wasn't great i think it kind of got back to form in here in the third season so if you haven't seen sweet tooth the first three episodes definitely check it out my last recommendation uh i'm talking to all my video game players out there uh if you haven't if you played elden ring in 2022 2023 i highly recommend getting back on it and then downloading and buying the new downloadable content the shadow of the earth tree it is really good it is insanely hard if you haven't played it in a while it's been about six months since i played the game you're going to have to go back and refamiliarize yourself with this it is one of the hardest games ever and they didn't they did not hold back on uh the dlc for this so uh if you're a gamer like me it's worth it it's really good you'll love being back in that entire universe but my gosh it's hard so uh i guess that kind of wraps us up for this anything else you want to share before we sign off uh, appreciate everyone joining us and we will talk to you next time and we don't know when we're coming back to this but we probably oh, yeah. will i'm glad you said that yeah we'll probably come back to it uh it's we're we're taking a break from it next week next week just to give you guys an idea of what's going on we'll be covering the we'll be coming a little bit later uh, we're not gonna be able to record until uh wednesday the third i think is what we decided uh yeah but we'll record that night we'll do our finale uh interview with the vampire and we'll end up doing the first four episodes of The Bear. We'll probably come back to this probably at the end of it, if I had to guess. Yeah, uh, so I that, think so. I, I, I would like to. Yeah, so like I said, we'll we'll probably come back to it whenever it uh, wraps up the season. And that should be right around the beginning of August, somewhere around there. So, uh, But that wraps us up our, for this week. So uh, other than that, I will echo your same sentiments. And as always, until next time, may all of your entertainment dreams come true.